Welcome to the program. I'm Jeff Checkman. The blue wave of the recent election would not have been possible without black women voters. The election of Doug Jones in Alabama would not have been possible without the turnout of black women. The recent focus on Stacey Abrams, Kamala Harris, Maxine Waters, Marsha Fudge, Oprah, and even Michelle Obama speak to the fact that democratic and progressive politics today, as well as our cultural politics, is being defined and even redefined by black feminist politics. When we look back at the history of black women and racial progress, women like Ida B. Wells, Fannie Lou Hamer, and even Rosa Parks, all of this should be no surprise. Today, Coupled with the Me Too movement and resistance to Trump, this change in our politics has the makings of a lasting, permanent, and far-reaching change. No one understands this better, both historically and contemporaneously, than my guest, Duchess Harris. Professor Harris was a Mellon Mays Fellow at the University of Pennsylvania. She did postdoctoral fellowships at the Institute of Race and Poverty at the University of Minnesota Law School and at the Womenist Studies Consortium at the University of Georgia. She's currently a member of the faculty at McAllister College, where she became the first chair of the American Studies Department. Professor Harris is a scholar of contemporary African-American history and political theory. She's the author of numerous books, both popular and academic, and it is my pleasure to welcome Duchess Harris here to talk about her new work, Black Feminist Politics from Kennedy to Trump. Professor Harris, thanks so much for joining us. Oh, my goodness. Thank you so much for having me. What a lovely introduction. Well, thank you. A delight to have you here. Black women have been involved in politics for a long time. They were leaders in the civil rights movement. Certainly uh, some of the people like Fannie Lou Hamer left a lasting impression on the movement. What's different now? What's happened in the 21st century that really has changed this in a profound way? One of the things that's happened in the 21st century is, of course, the creation of social media. And so something that I think a lot of people forget about the Black Lives Matter movement is that it didn't start on the ground. It started in cyberspace. It started as a hashtag. And so that is something that has helped mobilize particularly a younger generation of black women in politics. And to what extent do those younger black women understand the legacy, the shoulders that they're standing on? I think that these women really understood the legacy because we continue to inherit what the women have done before us. And so um, one thing that people might not know about Congresswoman Barbara Lee, who um, has represented um, a district in California for decades now, is that she was a legislative aide for Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm, who, of course, was the first black woman in Congress and the first black woman to run for president. And so there are people that are walking in the shoes of Barbara Lee's tradition, just doing it somewhat differently. And in doing it somewhat differently, did they understand that that really what's required today is is arguably different than what might have been required 40, 50, 60 years ago? Well, I think what's required is similar. Like what's required is getting the word out. It's just that we get the word out differently now. And so the savvy that you have with the younger women is understanding that people are on their move, on the move. They have their devices and it's a quick way to get the information disseminated. Um, If you're talking about Shirley Chisholm in the 1970s, People back then were using, um, you know, mimeograph machines, right? This is how copies were made. And then they were giving out flyers. Um, We don't do that anymore. The amount of power that black women have, particularly in politics, particularly in the South today, talk a little bit about that and what you've seen in terms of its increasing relevance. One of the reasons why black women have so much influence um, is based on the unfortunate fact of the incarceration rates of black men. So when black people were um, first getting involved in politics, when um, the Voting Rights Act was passed in 1965, and a lot of people don't realize how recent that was, and then you got 
um, contemporary elected officials, black men actually dominated the political space. What started happening in the 1980s was um, mass incarceration, which meant that men who were detained could not vote. And even in some states, once you were released, you still couldn't vote. This left disproportionately women in a position to then change um, the face of electoral politics. Talk about how they did that. Talk about the evolution of that, what you've seen historically. What I've seen historically is both an involvement um, within government and grassroots organizing around it, which is one of the things that I think is fascinating and particular to the African-American community. When we talk about politics, we're not just talking about Stacey Abrams running for governor. We're talking about the work that happens around it and also the positions that people are trying to make gains in that might not even have to do with elected um, positions. And I think that's what makes, um, you know, African-American involvement so um, effective is that we are trying to be everywhere at the same time. And how have men in the black community responded to this? You know, I think that there has been a lot of support for this because um, what a lot of people don't understand about black feminism is that black feminism champions um, black manhood. And so um, I think that there has been a lot of respect and admiration for people like Alicia Garza and Patrice Cullors and, um, you know, the founders of Black Lives Matter because they were championing black men who were being shot by the police. Tell us a little bit about the impact that Obama and the Obama administration had on all of this. You know, the Obama administration had um, a tremendous impact on um, galvanizing the black community because the highest turnout that African Americans have ever had in a presidential election was when he ran for president the first time in 2008. And so um, it really invigorated the community. Um, And then once again in 2012, um, the turnout was tremendous. What was fascinating, however, is that for African Americans um, who weren't, um, you know, particularly charmed by some of his leadership choices, they ended up starting their own movements going on um, simultaneously with the Obama administration. So you had all of it happening. And what has been the ongoing impact within the Democratic Party over the past several years? I mean, we've certainly seen it in terms of this this last election, but talk about what you've seen in terms of, of the policy impact and the the way it has shifted positions on several issues. I think the way that it has shifted positions is that the struggle within the Democratic Party right now is the question of how moderate the Democrats will be. And so it went without saying that um, the Democrats were going to be pretty centrist and moderate when you were dealing with, um, let's say, the Bill Clinton administration. Um, That is who he was as a president. And um, African-Americans didn't have enough influence at the time to um, push President Clinton further to the left. Um, Now there is enough influence that, um, you know, African-Americans are trying to get the Democratic Party to move further left. Mm -hmm. And to what extent will they be successful in that, do you think? And is there some pushback? Is there a more moderate side to black women in politics in the Democratic Party? You know, I think that's an excellent question because I think there's a different when you, difference when you are supporting a candidate and when you actually are the candidate. So if someone like Kamala Harris decides to run for president, she will be moderate, of course, because if you're running for president, you will have to be moderate. Um, there will be people around her that will push her not to be. Um, the same goes for someone like Cory Booker. Um, anyone who is in the Senate, because the African American community, you know, hasn't had a long tradition of having representation in the Senate, um, really isn't in a position to be very much left of center. Talk about Kamala Harris, because she's an interesting example, because she would be more moderate, 
but also has a long record of, of, I guess, law and order, for lack of a better description, when she was attorney general in California. Yes, I mean, Kamala Harris is fascinating, partly because she stands alone. Um, There aren't many black women in America that you can compare her to. She has had, um, you know, an interesting background with positions that most black women haven't had access to. She's only the second black woman to become a United States senator. The first black woman was, of course, Carol Mosley Braun, who only served one term. And so she is really inventing herself. Talk a little bit about the reaction. And and I suppose the Doug Jones election was maybe the, the penultimate example of this recently. How black women that are actively involved in the political process are responding to white male candidates. You know, I think that the um, Doug Jones election is a a wonderful way to look at the involvement of black women um, acting as um, participants in democracy. And once he was elected, one of the things that I thought was so important is that he made sure that his chief of staff was African-American. That's another aspect that a lot of people don't look at on the Hill. Um, People look at who's in the position and not necessarily who their staff are. And I don't think there have ever been more than two African-American chief of staff um, for congressional uh, representatives at one time ever in the history of the nation. And so um, I worked for Senator Paul Wellstone in the early 90s, and I was um, young at the time, so I was not a high-ranking staffer, but I was one of the only African-American staffers in the nation. And to that point, is there a bench being built up? Is it happening by accident, or is there a concerted effort to build up the potential members of of those staffs? I think that there is a concerted effort, but... You know, one of the things that many people don't understand is that, you know, the effort has to happen as early as preschool. And so you can't um, go to, you know, a university undergraduate program or a graduate program and, you know, look for talent of color if there aren't many students who are of color in those programs. And so what we need to do is work on the pipeline to make sure that the talent pool is there. And what's being done in that regard? What can be done? You know, what can be done is like um, a perfect um, example is an initiative from the Mellon Foundation. And what the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation has done is um, tapped into academic talent as early as a sophomore year of college. And they have um, tried to provide mentoring so that people can successfully go on um, to academic training that will um, put you in a position where you could do something like this. Arguably, all of this was happening and would have continued to happen, perhaps at a different pace, before Trump came along. What impact directly has Trump had on all of the things that we're talking about? Well, in many ways, Trump has galvanized people to do it, you know, even more. I mean, if you look at someone like Ayanna Presley, who ends up becoming um, the first black woman to represent Congress for the state of Massachusetts, um, I think she would say that part of her motivation to run for this office um, would be the political moment that was created in 2016. So I would argue that um, just because Trump has been elected president, that doesn't necessarily mean that um, it has to be a complete setback for black politics. You talk about the degree to which it has galvanized a lot of, of efforts. Talk a little more about that in terms of what you've seen that might not have happened if it wasn't for that pushback to Trump and, and, and what he represents. I mean, I think um, what might not have happened would have been um, the fervor of Me Too. Mm-hmm. Um, Me Too has actually been going on since 2006. And that's when the founder, Tarana Burke, came up with an action plan for Me Too. Um, So it actually did not come out of Hollywood. But I think that um, some of the things that Trump has been accused of and some of the things that were going on with um, the last confirmation 
um, proceedings for the most recent Supreme Court justice um, have made a lot of women, but particularly women of color, um, insist upon um, pushing back against these transgressions. And what has been the nexus between black feminist politics, as we've been talking about, and the Me Too movement? The nexus really has been socioeconomic status, because one of the things that um, has been missing from this conversation is what happens and you say, me too, and you are not a part of the elite class. Because, um, unfortunately, the track record is um, someone like Anita, Anita Hill, who was a part of the elite class. She was um, Yale-educated, you know, law professor who actually was um, a part of, um, you know, the Bush administration tangentially because she had worked for Clarence Thomas. And then um, you take, um, you know, Dr. Ford Blassie, who, you know, is a physician. She was respected, you know, for them to come forward and for the nation not to respond and galvanize around them and for the Senate to not hear them, that says a lot to someone who is just an everyday woman. And so the, the nexus for me, too, is to say that it's not just about womanhood. It's also at the intersection of, you know, not being high income, not having a lot of formal education. What happens if that's who you are? And you say me, too. What is the expectation of the movement going forward in terms of candidates running for president or vice president in in 2020? I think the expectation of the movement would be that we do not need elected officials um, who have um, track records of sexual assault, which seems um, unfortunate that that has to be spoken out loud, that that should have been the expectation for hundreds of years, but it just isn't. And so um, that's not a very high bar, but it's a standard that we need to have. What about in terms of the black community? What is the expectation? For the black community, the expectation, I would say, is that um, there be representation for, you know, working class people, blue collar people, disabled people, um, people who are gender nonconforming, um, you know, people that don't have a voice. And, you know, I would never um, posit that I could speak on behalf of 14 million black people. But I think that um, representation is always the goal. And what we've often had in electoral politics is just um, a reflection of the elite class. What's next for the movement for black feminist politics for Black Lives Matter? What what, what are the what are the objectives for the next five years? Let's say. You know, I also am not sure. You know, if you know, I can speak on movements that you know I'm not formally involved with. But what I would say is that it's important to be at the table. And so that is what um, the leaders in Black Lives Movement wanted when um, Hillary Clinton was running for president. And she was resistant early on. And um, it wasn't really until the 11th hour that she had mothers of the movement. And that would be someone like um, Trayvon Martin's mother. There were like nine women that joined her at the Democratic National Convention um, that stood with her. And all of their children had been killed by police officers. And so I think that um, that might be a beginning toward um, people in Black Lives Matter and Me Too um, want a seat at the table. Talk about the geography of the movement. We've talked a lot about the South, certainly, and Doug Jones and Stacey Abrams, and, and there's a great deal of this movement in urban centers. What about the rest of the country? You know, urban politics and rural politics have always been very different, regardless of, you know, the racial backdrop. Um, The industries are different. People earn their incomes differently. And so um, I live in Minneapolis, St. Paul. You know, black politics here is very different because we have such um, a large African immigrant population. So we just um, elected a Somali woman who's Muslim to Congress in the Twin Cities. Uh, That reflects the demographic of the 5th District in Minneapolis. Um, That's not the kind of politics you might get in, say, Memphis, Tennessee. 
Will the politics be different? We hear so much these days about Midwest politics versus politics in California or the South. Talk about it in in terms of the things that are absolute common themes across the country. I mean, I think common themes are employment. I mean, you know, basic existence in the United States is really about having a living wage and decent housing and education for people's children. Like that's at the core. Everything mm-hmm. after that is just um, a geographical nuance. Professor Duchess Harris, her book is Black Feminist Politics from Kennedy to Trump. Duchess, I thank you so much for spending time with us. This was an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.